We've already talked about Newton's first and second laws. We know that they can be summed up with the equation force equals mass times acceleration. Right? First and second laws all summed up into this equation. First and second laws right here. So this law already tells us quite a bit about nature, but in this video I want to talk about one more thing we can say about forces, and it's, it's known as Newton's third law. So what is the third law of Newton? And I think the simplest way to say it, or, or really the most direct way to say it, is that forces come in pairs. Forces come in pairs. Forces come in pairs. So often you'll hear Newton's third law said as something like, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And, and um, that's a bit misleading, or it's, it's, it's strange language, but really all it means is that forces come in pairs. So for example, we can think of anything, any situation at all where a force is involved. So maybe, maybe you know, I'm here, I'm bowling, right? I'm going to attempt to draw somebody who's bowling. So one of my arms is back and the other one's throwing the ball. And this is my bowling ball, right? So to accelerate this bowling ball and give it some speed toward the pins, I had to put a force on it, right? I had to, I had to give it or apply a force so that the mass would accelerate. That's, that's what I had to do to uh, throw the bowling ball. But it turns out that because forces come in pairs, that when I threw the bowling ball, put a force on it, the bowling ball actually also put a force on me. And you could say, with its inertia, it put a force on me. But I think you'll, you'll agree that, say, if I were wearing roller skates, these are my roller skates. I have a strange strange bowling form and, and oddly sized feet, but if I'm wearing roller skates and I throw a bowling ball, that I'll actually end up going backwards, right? The bowling ball is going forwards and I'm going backwards. So this is one example where forces come in pairs. I'm putting a force on the bowling ball, and then the bowling ball is actually putting a force on me. There's another example, maybe I'm playing in the outfield and a ball is a, or I'm playing baseball and I'm playing in the outfield and a ball has been hit toward me. So it's flying through the air and I want to catch the baseball and stop it. My baseball glove here, I'm going to catch the ball. Well, what happens when I catch the ball? I'll apply a force on the ball to stop it, right? I'm accelerating it. I'm taking it from one speed to another speed. So when the ball hits, it'll actually accelerate in this direction. And then what happens to my hand? Since forces come in pairs, when, when I apply a force in this direction on the ball, the ball actually applies a force in this direction on my hand. And I think you'll agree that, that when you catch something that's flying towards you, you can't, it's impossible to hold your hand completely still. Your hand will go backward with the ball, right? So these are just two examples, and you could you could give you know, really everything that happens is an example of this. Now that we've thought of a few examples, I should should be a little more precise about the way I said this. So I said that forces come in pairs. So instead of that, I'm going to I'm going to insert something into there. So forces come. Forces come in, I'm going to switch colors here for emphasis, this is a good color, sure, equal and opposite. Forces come in equal and opposite pairs. So this is actually a more accurate way of saying it, and this makes sense based on our experience, right? In these examples we can see that they're definitely in the opposite direction. And then we can think, well, if I, if I had a bigger ball flying at me, I would 
need to put more force on it to stop it and then I would fly back further. So it makes sense they're at least proportional to each other and it, it turns out that they're exactly equal. So now that we're convinced that forces come in equal and opposite pairs, let's think a little bit more about uh, a way that we can describe a force. So if we write down force equals mass times acceleration, right? what's another way to think about this, or another way to write this? So we'll keep mass. The mass doesn't change of an object. At least if it's not breaking apart and funny things aren't happening, the mass should stay constant. But we can write this acceleration as a change in velocity divided by a change in time, right? That's what acceleration is. It measures the change in velocity, measures how velocity changes as time changes, right? So now if we take the quantity mass times velocity here, right? Mass times velocity, and we're going to use the letter P to mean momentum. P. P is momentum, right? Mass times velocity. So um, if the mass is constant and the velocity is changing, the momentum's changing. So this is a change in momentum. Right? And then change in momentum and then divided by a change in time. Change in time. And if we want to write this in the language of calculus, we could call force is dp dt. And maybe I don't want to write them in different colors, but uh, dp dt the time derivative of momentum. Um, that's just how the momentum changes in time. So all we've done here is we've 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 rewritten F equals MA in a slightly different form. Uh, it means the same thing though. I realized that I was using orange instead of yellow for momentum here, so I'll change this, or attempt to change this. All right. So now we see that force is is the rate of change of momentum, right? dp dt. Now if we look at what we said at the beginning of this video, that forces come in equal and opposite pairs, that means that changes in momentum also come in equal and opposite pairs. So if we go up and look at this bowling ball again, we see that maybe, maybe this bowling ball gains some momentum in this direction, right? Delta P, right? It's momentum changed in this direction, so it's it gains some momentum to the right in this in this uh, in this example, and and according to what we've argued so far, that that changes in momentum come in equal and opposite pairs. That means that my change in momentum was this direction, and it should be the same size since they're equal and they're opposite, right? So now if we think about the total momentum of, of me and the ball, so even though the ball gained some momentum, I gained the same amount of momentum in the opposite direction. So that when we add up all the momentum before and after, it should always be the same, right? In everything. Because if this applies all over the place, it means that it's impossible to create momentum. Impossible to create momentum. impossible to create or to destroy momentum, right? Destroy momentum. So this is what's known as the conservation of momentum. So you hear that a lot in physics. Conservation of momentum. Now it's probably difficult to, to really appreciate how big this is, the conversation, or the, excuse me, the conservation of momentum. So hopefully this video has convinced you that momentum is conserved, and we'll leave it to future videos to illustrate just how important this really is.